Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jake Sewell of Bravehawk Forge. I had Jake on the show just a few months back on episode 440, leading up to the Texas Custom Knife Show, which Jake co-produced and invited me to be a part of. Well, the show happened a little over a month ago, as you've heard me talk about, probably endlessly. And as we record this, uh, that's how long it was ago. I wanted to uh, bring Jake back on to sort of debrief about an insider's look at putting on a knife show and see what it's all about, because uh, there is more to it than uh, what you see on the surface. So uh, we'll catch up with Jake in just a minute. But first, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And join us on Patreon, where you can get all sorts of extras, including knife content and uh, extras of these interviews. Also, you might just win a knife every month. Check it out at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Jake, welcome back to the show. It's good to see you, sir. Hey, thanks a lot, Bob. I appreciate it. Oh, you know, it's a pleasure. I just want to congratulate you on the Texas Custom Knife Show. You know, there was a lot of lead up to it, for me anyway. And then going there and being a part of it and uh, and watching you hustle and watching you guys put that on uh, was something else. So congratulations on a job well done, sir. Well, thank you very much. And I got to say, man, you were such a big help. I mean, Bob was there on Friday, helping me set stuff up. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's an ordeal to put on one of these knife shows, especially a two day event where you're really looking to have a bunch of people show up. Um, and anytime you can get somebody to help out, it's, it's great. And Bob was there every day, ready to work and ready to do whatever I needed him to do. It was great. That's so uh, we can come back anytime he wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. You'll get some labor out of me. That's, uh, that's what you get. Uh, coming up through the independent film uh line of work when i was a when i was much younger you know none of those movies get made uh if people don't all pitch in so it's a lot of fun for me and uh you know uh, one thing i noticed actually uh, this this was an immediate thing i noticed coming from right outside dc here uh and always kind of living in more of an urban environment you get out to texas and the distances between things are are vast okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, I have a day job. I'm a electrical technician, so I do testing and stuff. And on average, I drive about a minimum of 600 miles a week oh. for my job. So, yeah, I mean, luckily that venue that we were at was five minutes from my house. So <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that venue. Uh, getting there. And like I said, being from out of town, it took me a second and then I found it. And it was like this little uh, oasis of uh knife nerddom and and just it was oh, yeah. it was great uh tell us about the spot and how did you decide on where on the venue for the texas custom knife show so the first texas custom knife show that guy harris and uh mike thomas my partner put on was at that event uh was at that venue at the lone star convention center the pavilion there uh it's called like the equestrian center i think was its official name um so that was where the first one was. And I was just a vendor there. And that's actually the day I flew out to go film for Forged and Fire. So uh, we, after that, me and Mike hooked up and started partnering up. And we started doing it at the Southern Star Brewery. And, you know, they gave us the event space for free. And it was outdoors in the grass, which, you know, has its ups and downs. The previous year, uh, we got rained out. And the only reason we had anybody show up was because Doug Markaito was there. And people stood in the rain in 40-degree weather to get an autograph by that man. And it was, uh, he was our saving grace that Saturday for sure. So we decided we were gonna go somewhere where it was covered. And, uh, you know, knife makers are, we're, we're particular. Uh, I, I actually had a lot of people tell me, no, I won't come to your event because it's not indoors. 
And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing forging demos and we're going to be destroying a bunch of ballistic dummies and this and that. So I can't be indoors because, you know, it's going to be hot or, it, you know, I'm going to have four forges running at one time and a bunch of machinery so I can do yeah. this competition. So it's like trying to keep everybody happy and trying to get, you know, trying to get people to show up is the hardest part. Knife, knife makers included. So. Well, uh, uh, that outdoor venue, uh, just from, again, a Yanks perspective, it, it looked like something you would expect to see in Texas because uh, right next door, we were under this giant uh, covered space that was basically an empty covered space. But right next door, there was like a, a stock lot, I think, where mm -hmm. auctions yes. happen uh, for steers and stuff. And for me, I was like, man, I want to see I want to see that while we're setting up. I want to witness a, a stock, uh, you know, a stockyard, a Texas cattle auction. oh yeah it seems like very authentic to me uh but the space itself was uh was great for the kind of show you were putting on and you mentioned uh before that you were on forged in fire and a lot of this mm -hmm. um a lot of the texas custom knife show is based around that experience how did that uh sprout so like i said guy and uh guy harris he, who's passed away um and mike got together mike's a marketing guy uh guy is a was actually on the pilot episode of Forged and Fire before they even really started filming seasons. And then he was also, I think, on season one, episode one. So he was one of the first up and comers in, in Forged and Fire. And he's well, he was well known in the knife making industry. Um, him and Mike got together and said, hey, let's let's put on a show based around Forged and Fire. Well, it didn't work out as well as they wanted it to the first year. So I called, you know, since it was so close to my house, I said, Mike, are you going to do the show again this year? I'll help out if you need. And he's like, I wasn't going to do it, but if you want to get together, I mean, you can talk about it. And that's when me and Mike started partnering up and started doing the Texas Custom Knife Show. And it's only grown um, in in size, in the amount of days that we do, in I don't want to say the amount of attendance because this year was extremely slow and it was extremely frustrating to put in, you know, the countless hours that me and Mike put in, and then not have that many people come through the gate. Uh, you know, we had, I think less than a thousand tickets sold, which last, you know, in previous years we sold upwards of 1200. So it, it had a lot to do with the, uh, opening day of deer season, uh, here in oh. Texas is like, it's like religion. So, but we only could rent that event space that weekend. So it was kind of like a catch 22 kind of thing. Like either we don't do the show or we got to, you know, not do it in November or, you know, it's, it's always something so but it's only grown and we've only been able to get more forge and fire based uh entertainment for everybody to enjoy i mean the, last year we had doug markita this year we had doug markita and jay nielsen which was a huge hit uh both of those guys are just top-notch guys uh i'm sure you got to talk with doug i mean you got to you got to do a demo a martial arts demo <laughs> with doug, was which was awesome it was awesome, man. I, I Doug was asking me, "Did you did you watch that?" And I was like, "Well, yeah." I was. He's, he's like, "No, you didn't." I saw you running around working on stuff, and I was like, "I mean, I'm the host. That's all. That's all I do is yeah. run around with my head frazzled." So, <laughs> but it was awesome to see the video of that because I did get the video of that, and uh, watching you get to kind of duke it out with Doug is pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. to be clear, we were not duking it out. I would not be here right now if we were duking it out. But <laughs> we were jamming like musicians. That's that's what he yeah. called it. And I like that because, uh, you know, we had uh, obviously he's like miles and miles and miles and years and years of experience above me. But we had no context. So he wanted to find out what I knew. And uh, that was just great. That was so. Yeah. And working with a guy like that, you know, I've done a fair bit of it. Um, so working with a guy like that, he can he can guide me. You know what I mean? He can yeah. tell what I know. And then, uh, so that was, a, that was your a, movement. Exactly. It was a real honor for me, uh, because yeah. he made me look good and, uh, it was so much fun. Uh, but yeah, a, a huge part of the show, um, uh, you were talking about frustrations with attendance. Um, but, uh, I, you know, never having been to that show, I, I was seeing something uh, different because I was seeing, uh, Doug Mark Markaida and Jay Nielsen, uh, judges and stars from Forged in Fire, uh, doing a lot of, um, you know, they kind of marshaled a lot of attention and they did these great, um, 
demonstrations, whether they were uh, um, uh, uh, forge well uh, doing a canister Damascus or 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 hosting the forging contest. They were up there, their rapport together and telling stories. It seemed to really naturally fit. And I thought they had already done that the year before. How did this uh, come together? So Doug, we reached out to uh, before last year's show and were able to get him on board and uh, have him come down because he's, he loves supporting the knife community and he's, he's part of the knife community. He sells, um, he sells his designs through his website and everything like that. Doug Markita.com. Oh yeah. You got one too. Mine's mine's in the room. Oh, uh, <laughs> I got the, I got the Falcon. No, I'm sorry. The Talon flip combat. It, I cut myself with it the first day playing with it and wound up rubbing his autograph off of it. And so I had to go to him at the end of the night and have him re-autograph it and then <laughs> nice. give it to my wife so that she could seal it with oh, uh nail polish with like clear coat nail polish because i i was playing with it so much i rubbed his autograph off and it was pretty funny but um <laughs> so we got we got doug on board for 2022 show and then at uh there's a show here in belleville called the texas select custom culinary event texas select you can go to texasselect.com cowboy and eilina put it on uh, they're out of Phoenix Knives there in Belleville, and it's one of the only two shows I do. I do my show and I do their show because I just have a full time job. I got a family, you know. It's it's a lot for me to do a show because I do the tomahawk throwing and everything like that. Um, I want to do more shows. I just got to find more time, and if I could get somebody like an apprentice to come and help me make tomahawks, I'd <laughs> probably be able to have the products to uh, bring to a show. But anyways, they do a show there, and they had Jay. Um, well, Jay came to our show last year as like a surprise visit just to mess with Doug because he heard Doug was going to be in town and Jay's um, new lady is here in Texas. So he's in Texas a lot now. So he showed up and I was like, man, we'd love to have you. And then in Belleville, I was able to actually talk to him and kind of solidify things and like, Hey, we want you to come out. We want you to do a forging demo. We want you to do some, some blade testing and all this and that. And uh, it was, it was pretty awesome getting both of those guys together because they are friends, you know, uh, they're, they're not just TV friends, but they are friends. They, yeah. they they work well together and they razz each other just like any other guys would do outside of work. So yeah. they're fun. Yeah, they're, they they struck me as two guys who've worked together for 10 years and like each other. You know, yeah. I got I got a couple of those guys at work and, and we have a shorthand for for humor mm -hmm. and everything. I mean, our producer right here, Jim, is is one of them. And uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the vibe I got from from those guys and i it brought a lot to that show it, it it made it a real you know event um and it was it was fun to hear some of the inside baseball on the making of forged in in yeah. fire you know the q a is one of my favorite parts because uh you know the crowd gets to ask them questions that they're always curious about yeah. you know about the show and what got them into the show how did they actually get to be on the show um you know, and it it's just fun for them to get to know them more on like a personal basis. And that's why we do the Q&A every year. So, well, just so uh, in case uh, people didn't listen to episode 440, tell people how you got onto <clears throat> Forged in Fire and how you got involved in the show, what that what that whole experience was like. So I started blacksmithing when I was 12. My grandfather took me to my first Houston Area Blacksmith Association meeting. And uh, I fell in love with it and I had a natural knack for it was what all the instructors there said. So I've dabbled for many a year. And then in 2018, I started my business, Braypock Forge. And with the sole means of wanting to make top quality tomahawks, I make a lot of custom knives. But on my website, you really have to reach out to me to be like, hey, I want a custom knife made. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And I can do any kind of knife there is. I just on my website, I mainly sell tomahawks. But uh me and my wife were watching an episode of Forge and Fire shortly after starting the business, and it was a railroad spike knife competition. And I was like, I've made hundreds of those. These guys suck. I could totally do it, you know, you know, backseat driving kind of thing. So a Monday morning quarterback in it. Uh, and so I was like, I'm going to go and, you know, I found something online saying that they were, they were casting. So I filled out an application, went through the whole process of doing the Skype interviews and multiple interviews and uh 
they said, all right, well, you're accepted. We're going to, we're going to reach out to you and we'll have you come up. It's like, all right, cool. Please give me enough notice to tell my company. Cause you know, I have a full-time job. They called me on Wednesday saying, Hey, we had a bladesmith drop out. And this is after like two or three months of waiting for them to call me. Hey, we had a, a bladesmith drop out. Can you come on Saturday? And that was the first day of the Texas custom knife show. My first real knife event that I was going to go to. And I was setting in my tomahawk throwing competition. I had my best friend and his wife and my wife and my grandfather coming out to help me. And I was like, babe, can we, can I do it? Like, can you handle the show? And she's like, yeah, let's just go and get set up. You don't have to, mm-hmm. you don't have to go to the airport until noon. So it'll give us like three hours to get everything set up and kind of get the kinks rolled out. And I left it in there and went to the airport and spent three or four days in Connecticut filming. So and it was right before Thanksgiving. So it was awesome. And then obviously I got, I didn't win. I'm not a champion. I keep telling Forge and Fire, like, hey, give me another shot because I want that champion title. Um, and I got a very close second with my Nagamaki. And uh, that thing is so you know, cool. It, yeah. It's just, it's the community itself. Once you're one of the Forge and Fire guys, like obviously the knife community itself, there's a bunch of really cool dudes. But having that, like, Hey, I was on Forge and Fire too. And there's a lot of us. I mean, there's probably a thousand or more. I, I don't remember what Doug said at the show, but he he put he belted out a number of how many contestants were on the show, and uh, we're all like, "Oh yeah, me too." You know, it's like a brotherhood. <laughs> That's so cool. that Nagamaki, it's a it's a gigantic samurai sword. Basically, it's a huge blade mm-hmm. and then an equally huge handle, and uh, it was really cool to to see it. Uh, I didn't get a chance to to heft yours. Um, bunch of people, there were, there were a number of, of championship, uh, blades there or, or, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, finalist win- blades, finalist blades there. They were amazing, uh, to look at. And, uh, yours was man, just gorgeous. I wish I should have, I should have handed you mine. Mine's only three pounds. Yeah. It was, it's, it's like seven feet long and three pounds or whatever it is. Six feet long. It's, it's huge. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a it's interesting you say there are like a thousand of you or a whole bunch of contestants. I, I don't know what number I would put it at if I were to guess, but it's a good concept for building a show around. Um, oh, yeah. So, you know, what why would. OK, this is going to sound crazy, but why would someone do this? It seems like kind of a crazy thing to do to put on a knife show. Oh, um, it is crazy uh, what, because I have the passion, you know. I have the passion for it uh, and I like getting all my buddies together. I mean, that's really whenever I have the downtime, like on Friday afternoon, Friday evening, when I'm done setting up all the booth spaces and I can actually just hang out with the fellas or, you know, end of the day, Saturday when stuff is winding down Sunday, I got to walk around and talk to a bunch of guys, but it's given my fellow knife makers an, an opportunity to sell their product, to showcase and sell their product, even if they don't make a sell. Um, at least get a chance to show their product to people that have come to see a knife show. Um, that's, and I guess I'm a little crazy cause it's a lot of work. I mean, I can't, I can't explain how much work it is. It's ridiculous. So countless hours. I mean the night before the show. Yeah. So Thursday night I was up until about midnight, one o'clock doing stuff around my shop, trying to get stuff ready. Friday morning I was out there at 6 AM to open the gate for the guys that cooked us that awesome barbecue on Friday night, uh, twisted, twisted Creek seasonings. They cooked all day. We had a great, great amount of pork that night. And then I stayed until Friday night. I stayed until about, I stayed at the venue until about 1145 trying to figure out some electrical problems so that I could run my press for the next morning's, uh, forging competition. And then finally I just threw my hands up. I was like, I gotta be back here at six. So I went home, showered, did what I had to do at the house and then got like four hours of sleep. And I was back out there Saturday morning at 6 AM. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot that goes into it and it's a lot of effort, but it's, it's just the passion, man. That's, that's all I can really say is I just have a passion to do it. And, uh, I like getting all my buddies together and giving them an opportunity to sell. Yeah. It was a a great environment and uh, it was really cool for me to meet and talk to a whole bunch of Texas knife makers. Not that, not that they were, um, limited to texas knife makers but i talked to a lot of people from texas and i thought it was uh it was really 
cool for me. It was a different, it was just a way to investigate a different part of our culture. Um, not just our, our knife culture, but our United States culture. And uh, it was really cool for me. But uh, that shows putting something on like that. It seems to be like it's going to be an expensive uh, prospect. How do you fund putting together a show like this? I would imagine I'm sorry. Uh, a me, lot of it. Let me turn off. Yeah. Let me turn off this voicemail. For a response, please send an email to Brave. <laughs> Uh, a lot of it seems to be, um, well, and it's an expensive prospect. You got a lot of people, you got a lot of stuff, you have a space you got to rent, uh, <clears throat> and uh, electric, everything you got to pay for. I, I, I would assume this is a sponsor heavy um, oh, yes. uh, prospect. 100%. So, how do, you, how do you go about it? And what are some of the challenges with securing um, sponsors? Um, sponsorships are difficult uh trying to convince somebody hey we have a nice show we can advertise for you we have a good social media following of a couple you know you know of thousands or whatnot um we'll give you these avenues of advertising for this amount of sponsorship money um mike really handles that and he killed it this year on sponsorship i got maybe a couple small sponsors to help sponsor the awards and stuff for our award ceremony and sponsor the, uh, the knife building competition, stuff like that. I kind of concentrate on more of the logistics part of the show and Mike handles the sponsorship and the advertising, putting up billboards, putting out radio ads and online stuff. So that's why we kind of work together real well, well is because he lets me handle the stuff at the show with, you know, input and then, I just let him handle the advertising because I ain't got the time for it. I mean, neither one of us really have the time for it. And he puts in a lot of hours doing that, but um, he killed it this year and got us quite a bit of like a lot more sponsorship money than we've had in the past. And we were able to really network. And that's why we were kind of, me and Mike were kind of disappointed on the turnout, but I told him it had everything to do with deer season. And uh, a lot of the guys were a little upset you know, coming out, they invest, you know, they paid money to have a booth space and, um, which all goes into operating costs. Every, every penny we take for tables that we charge our guys goes into operating costs because there's signs that have to be made and this and that, the dinner, stuff like that. Um, so that's why we were kind of disappointed when we only had so many people come out and it wasn't anywhere close to what we were telling people we were expecting. And, you know, the other the other complaint I got from knife makers was, you know, you're having a knife show, but you have Doug and Jay on stage for 70 percent of the day talking, keeping the crowd at the stage and they're not walking around looking at knives. And I'm all like, Doug and Jay are the reason people are coming. So like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> like, I, I, I try and hit the collectors up. But I mean, that's that's really who you want to come to a knife show. Somebody like yourself who's a knife collector. Yeah. You like to you like to look at knives. You like to buy knives. You like to collect them, and that's a really hard market to nail down. I mean, we we put in knife magazine advertisements. We put in you know all of the social media that has anything to do with knives. We we marketed to, and it just happened to not work out this year. But we're talking about next year already. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, coming from my perspective, I, it, so much of that show was like right up my alley. As a matter of fact, all of it was right up my, my alley. And, and, uh, and the thing I thought of was, Oh, you know, like more folder representation, uh, might, might, uh, bring more people. I wasn't actually thinking in those terms, but I'm thinking in those terms right now because I saw a lot of what I love in terms of, um, uh, I, you know, I'm an ED fixed blader and I love big Bowies and, and all of that. Um, but folders are a huge market too. And there are a lot of Texas make makers I'm starting to learn. So, so the, the folder market is huge. And the thing is, is those guys that make those folding knives, uh, so at our show, we don't allow pre-manufactured knives. I actually had to boot a couple of people uh, that I found out were, you know, they were, they were wholesalers, I guess you would call them. Okay. So they didn't make the knives. You have to make your own products at our show. And it's, okay. it states that on our vendor website or on our Zen vendor sign-up sheet. 
you, everything has to be handcrafted, handmade or hand forged in the United States. So we don't allow, I mean, Doug was kind of an exception. Uh, he has his own line of knives, but I'm not going to tell Doug, no, you can't yeah. bring your own stuff. I mean, yeah, they're know. made in Italy. That's okay. Speaking as a Paisan. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so we, the folder, the folder market itself, the guys that make folding knives, those things are high dollar and they don't want to be in an outdoor event. Mm -hmm. So that's where I, you get what I'm saying? So they want, yeah. they want an indoor event. And as of right now, we don't have that type of venue available. Um, we're looking into other venues and other options to try and get some of those high end knife makers. Cause those guys that are selling their blades for 1200, 2500, stuff like that, they're not going to want to come to an event to where there's any chance that their stuff is going to be have any access to moisture, you know, in Texas weather, especially around here, yeah. you're looking at 60% humidity year round minimum. So, um, we, we've run into that multiple times and it's just a hard battle to fight. So, well, actually, uh, just spitballing. It seems like something that actually might happen organically. Like uh, Brian Malinsky, who I had on on the show not too long ago. He hit the guy who. How did you How did you tell who's who? I know exactly. We had our We had our names right here, so we could tell. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he's uh, he's uh, a um, a fixed blade maker who has been a very man, a very talented guy making beautiful folders and kind of. Uh, um, moving into that. So he had a lot of those, he had a number of folders at the show and maybe it, maybe that's something that just happens organically. And there were, there were other guys there. Um, uh, the gentleman who, oh man, there's so many people. Um, James Hughes had a couple. That's um, who it is. James Hughes. Yeah. Uh, he had some slip joints that were beautiful. Uh, he had a stockman mm -hmm. that I was, uh, you know, ogling and, um, so it, and that's another cool thing for me. I love slip joints, you know, uh, uh, granddad knives. And there were some, uh, very nice representations of that there too. Uh, cause it's kind of a more, uh, country thing. It's kind of a more old fashioned thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I've made a couple of folders. I've only really ever made friction folders. I've never made any, uh, slip joints or any kind of locking. Uh, I'm, I want to get into it. I'm not sure if I have the patience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's something you were, you else. Were you were t you were talking about the passion before. You, mm -hmm. Like some something like folders seem just complicated enough, just just enough of a pain in the neck that you need like a certain amount of passion. Uh, oh yeah, for that. But you obviously have the tomahawk passion in spades. Um, uh, but but yeah, the the folder thing. That's a that's another way. Uh, to, to bring people in. But what I loved about the Texas custom knife show, uh, was tomahawks, buoys. Uh, there were, there were a couple of people there doing some kind of experimental stuff. Uh, one of the guys who I'm sorry, I'm forgetting names now, but one of the gentlemen who was in, uh, the forging competition, which I want to talk about for a second, that was mm -hmm. so cool to watch. But one of those guys, uh, the, the gentleman who's, uh, um, he, he just had some very interestingly shaped blades, um can't remember his name. Well, we had we had uh Jonathan Sibley. It was long a beard Sibley. guy. Um now you put me on the spot. It was the uh, it was the guy who's Chris Farrell. Who... Chris Farrell. Okay. He's the longer hair guy that wore the hat with the little pipe in it all the time. That's the guy. That's yeah, the guy. He's he's a character, man. I love I've known Chris Farrell for whew, going on six, seven years now, and he's always a character, man. He's he a makes some awesome stuff making some very unique stuff. In other words, like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it wasn't just, um, traditional style styled knives there. There's some, some really, of your zombie killer kind of stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exotic, <laughs> like Indian, Indian and Filipino knives meet zombie killer. Uh, there's some very cool meat pirate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, what was I going to say about that? Oh, the forging competition though. Now this was really cool. This is a part uh, this was the the most obvious tie to forged in fire besides the personalities. So you had four forges set up uh, right right in this uh, cordoned off area near the stage. It was really well done. Uh, I was very impressed with uh, the amount of power you were to get to everything uh, you had there. Um, so that was, that was well done. That was a hassle, man. Uh, we had 
we had four grinders donated by Broadbeck Grinders. They uh, brought, they shipped them out to me. Uh, I, they helped, they set them up. But the problem is, is those grinders don't want to run off of the GFCI. GFCI. Okay. So of course, the generator I, I rented in order to run these four grinders is equipped with GFCIs. So I had to like run hundreds of foot of extension cord all around the building, just trying to get power to those grinders. Uh, they were kicking offline during the competition, but uh, yeah, it's it's my favorite part of the show. Um, it's a lot of work for me because I have to get the four Smiths committed, find out what they're bringing, find out what I need to supplement as far as anvils, forges, hammers, tongs, grinders, chisels, you know, you name it. If they're not going to bring it, I have to figure out how I'm going to get it. Um, and I try and get a lot of it sponsored. Like I got the propane that I was running my forge off of that both Chris and Jonathan were using. Um, I got that donated. Um, I pretty much take my entire shop apart with the exception of my big blue because that thing weighs like 2,500 pounds and I'm not moving it. Um, I took my press, which weighs about seven, 800 pounds fully. Uh, I don't, I didn't have to do my grinders this year, which is great because it's a real pain to take those grinders apart and put them back in right where they need to be and tune them up and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Uh, forges, anvils, hammers. I brought everything that I think anybody would need. And then these guys battle for four hours straight. So and, you uh, already created, you created four uh, bar stock, yeah. uh, four pieces of bar stock for them to start with. So if you're a Forge and Fire fan, which I'm sure many people listening are, um, you know, they, they start from scratch on Forge and Fire. We didn't have 12 hours uh, for no, this we forge, did it. forging competition. So uh, Jake very generously, uh, it was what, a, a 1095, 15, and 20. I gave billet. him a 139 layer Damascus billet that was about nine inches long by a half, a half inch thick by an inch and a half wide. So I gave him a billet bigger than they needed and they had to make a overall length of no greater than 20 inch blade. So 13 to 15 inch cutting edge. And um, to do that in four hours, to have it, handled yeah. first of all to hammer it out grind it heat treat it put a handle on it and then have it ready for testing within four hours is a feat and, and, and also knowing that it's going to be auctioned off at the end yes. you know uh yes. even if it doesn't survive so uh these guys want to want to put their best foot forward uh for sure mm -hmm. and that was amazing to watch four hours it, that was amazing it's a it's a very fast four hours that goes by pretty quick, especially if I'm, you know, as me as the host, because I'm trying to, you know, get stuff done and trying to get the judges on stage to keep people up there to watch and yeah. do a Q and A while these guys are hammering out. And um, Chris Farrell was actually he. I called him on Wednesday before the show, just like the Forge of Fire called me and said, "Hey, I had somebody drop out due to, to an injury. Can you fill in a spot? You you participated before. Will you participate this time?" And he was like, yeah. So we gave, <coughs> I'm sorry. we gave him all the four hours, but the other three competitors had months to, to make their handle and guards ahead of time. Oh. So at the end, Chris was unhappy because he didn't have as much time to prep like the handle. And, you know, Don Halter, who was our winner this year, two time winner. Um, he made such a beautiful blade. And then our second place winner, Corey Yates, who was our underdog, impressed me quite, you know, he yes. impressed me a lot. He did a great job. And it was when it came down to judging, it was me, Jay Nielsen, Doug Markaida, and one of our sponsors who sponsors every year standing behind stage talking about, hey, you know, it, this one tested great. This one, you can see that it's got a little rough spot, you know, in the handle. And it's kind of a hot spot. And we went through it all just like they do on the show. And then we we're like, all right, well, this one's four, three, two, one. Let's call them up, announce the winners, and then we'll auction these blades off. So not only did we auction the blades off, but I had a picture taken with the judge. I'm sorry, the, the maker of the blade and both judges. And then I had, I had my printer there, printed them off on photo paper yeah. and had everybody sign them. And then I put it into a shadow box with the blade. So, I mean, it was like a whole ordeal, like a collector's oh, cool. piece. And we only had like 10 people in the dang auction. I... I was bidding on blades. I, My I, wife's bid, like, I bid on one of the blades <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then I, I, I ran out. <laughs> My wife came up to me and said, you're playing a dangerous game, sir. <laughs> I, <heard that. laughs> I was like, I okay, I'm done. 
You're pushing out. the prices up. I, I love that. I was like, oh man. Uh, yeah. So, that, but we, that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. We uh we the auction that we do is to raise money for uh the Operation Red Wings Foundation. So it's a it's a nonprofit charity that helps uh veterans with their invisible injuries of war, you know, PTSD and stuff like that. Not only that, but they um they also bring out their families. So rather than just having the the uh veteran themselves come out, they bring their families and they all do counseling together. So it's mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a charity that's real close to my heart and I'm actually in the talks of uh starting a charity of my own. Uh, obviously not of that magnitude, but um anytime I can help out a veteran, I'm a veteran myself and uh anytime I can help out a vet, I'm I'm all about it. So what what are you um what are you looking to do? What's your vision? Okay. Uh so my vision is to have a small group, three, four, maybe five vets come out to my shop free of charge and do a class because I teach classes here at my shop and uh you know we could talk about how how what's going on with them, but I would like to explain my mindset on forging. So when you're forging, you're taking a piece of steel, right? That's just a bar, nothing, nothing special about it. You heat it up, you hammer on it, and you form it into something that's beautiful. And I always look at that that method as a relation to life. I mean, especially in my own life, I've, trust me, I've been hammered on a lot myself and I am the person I am today because of that. And there's a lot of relation, you know, there's a lot of crossover that we could talk about. Okay. Well, you know, now we're, we've got this thing forged out. It's rough. Let's go grind on it. Let's go take away that, that excess that we don't need. All right. Let's go take it, take it away. Now, now we're ready for heat treat. We're going to heat this up and we're going to, we're going to cool it off real fast. And there's just a lot of things that I could feel like relate to veterans. And there's, I'm not, the, this is, I'm not a pioneer in this. There's guys that do this already. Uh, I just want to do it myself and I want to get in uh, touch with the veterans bureau around here. The, the veteran owned business bureau, who is one of our sponsors at the show. Um, Cause I'm sure they would help sponsor me that, in that so that I could get these guys out here free of charge. I would also like having maybe a keynote speaker. Um, my, the lady that cuts my hair is trying to be a life coach and having somebody like her or even like Jocko or, you mm. know, yeah. Latrell, you know, one of, one of those guys to come out and hang out for the day with these guys and be like, Hey, you know, it's, it's rough. I know, but you can get through it. That's, that's all I want. And it's, it's going to happen. I just have to hammer out the logistics of it and get the, get the networks going and stuff like that. So. I, I, I've heard of, uh, people doing, uh, forging classes and knife making classes for veterans. And actually I did a piece for work about, uh, a local, uh, knife Smith who was doing that. And, uh, it's very impressive. I mean, um, and, and he related something to me that's interesting, but you said something I've never heard. And, uh, the gentleman that I interviewed, and I've heard this before from other people, uh, related to me that it's, it's, um, a place where uh, it's a process that veterans can lose themselves in positively because there's an order to things. And, mm-hmm. uh, and when you're in the military, you're used to following orders in certain order and, and in doing certain processes that make mm-hmm. sense and result in certain uh, yield, certain results. Uh, but what you, and, and I, and I like that because that's a, that's a function thing. That's like operating on, okay, these people are used to functioning in this way. So let's tap in through the function. But what mm-hmm. you're saying is very interesting because it's, it's a, it's more of a philosophical parallel, uh, like, okay, we've pounded it out and it's kind of roughly shaped. Now let's refine it. Let's take off these things we don't need. Yeah. And to me, that sounds like a more philosophical approach. So that's a, it's a, it's, it sounds like an interesting way of going about it. And that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at is because I mean, I always, I've, I've had like conversations, I guess, with myself, uh, in, in the forge and I would, this is kind of conversations I'd want with hat to have with a vet that's struggling, you know, like, all right, we're going to hammer on this piece of steel. When have you felt like you've been hammered on in your life and, and why, you know, and we, while the steel is heat, because there's a lot of time where you're standing around waiting for steel to get hot, 
or you're sitting around waiting for steel to cool off. You know what I mean? So it there's there's way we can bring the bring the conversation into like you said the format of you know forging something out and we can relate the two things together to where I can get them to open up and maybe think about it think about it in like internal to their you know internal like hey I never thought of it that way and maybe it'll, if I could help one guy out of 10 I'd be happy you know what I mean and that's yeah that's where and, I'm trying to get to and they're going to uh, there's also um a trust there that that would be um, immediate with you because you've uh, been there uh, yeah. as opposed Actually, to, as opposed to a, someone who I, might, who might just be teaching them, but you've been there. Yeah. So I had a class this weekend. Uh, I had my Christmas party on Saturday and then uh, turned around and uh, had a tomahawk class with three gentlemen who bought a gift certificates last Christmas. And they just finally been able to schedule it oh, for the cool. second time. They had to cancel it the first time, but uh, anyways, one of the guys was a Marine and, uh, he said something, I, something about coloring books. And I was like, oh man, I better not catch you eating crayons in here. And, you know, <laughs> it's just an automatic, like, he's like, oh, you're military. What, what branch? And I told him I was in the air force and he's like, oh man, you must be good at golf. And you know, like, <laughs> yeah. which I suck at golf. So, um, I love all that. so it's, I feel like it'd be good. Like you said, I'm a vet. I wasn't, I was never deployed. I was actually a jet engine mechanic in the air force. I lived in Japan for two years. Uh, I worked on the AWACS. So my, oh, my, my, my job was mission critical. We spied a lot on North Korea. Well, not spied, but we kept track of them. Yeah. Uh, cause you know, they're always popping off at the mouth and, uh, they, <laughs> so that my job was technically mission critical. So yeah. anytime, they needed to be in the air. We were on standby. If that if that plane comes down, the other one's going up, and it has to be fueled up, oils ready, everything's tip top shape. Because I mean, those those jets are from the fifties. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, right. They those some, are old airframes, and work. they're constantly in the air, right? I mean, if one's oh, yeah. not up, the other one oh, is. Yeah. Or... Yep. Twenty four seven. So it was. Uh, I, I never had any combat experience or anything like that. So I would like to hear those stories. I you know I'm. I love watching the movies and, and listen to the stories of the combat vets that I've talked to. Uh, and, Cause those guys are, I mean, th there's no, that's one of the reasons I want to help out is because I, I understand what they kind of what they went through uh, as far as just seeing and hearing these stories and how it can damage you internally you know all those vietnam vets and stuff that came back not right and still not right and some people can handle that kind of stress and some people can't i just want to help those people that can't so yeah but you also understand in that you voluntarily basically gave your life uh oh, yeah people like me and my family and others you know uh so whether or not you're deployed is is uh, well that's another that's a whole other dimension but whether or not you mm -hmm. deployed is almost immaterial because the fact is you already made the sacrifice. You said, I, I, you know, um, and that's, that's why a lot of people like myself say to people like you, thank you for your service. And I'm saying that right now because you kept those beautiful AWACSs in the sky and, and kept the <laughs> eyes uh, down on yeah. the ground for us. And um, so uh, I think just making that initial sacrifice is, is enough for other people to look and say, okay, I'm going to listen to this guy. And um, yeah. And, you know, all the branches razz each other. I mean, I know, it's, I it's a that. constant, we, we love it. You know, the air force gives crap to the coast guard and everybody else, it goes up from there, you know? <laughs> so like, it's always the Marines at the top that are talking yeah. down to the Navy right. and the Navy's talking down to the army and the army's talking down to the air force and we just give it all back. So, uh, you know, it's, it's fun and it's all in good fun. No, no branches. If, if I was in, in dire strait and some Marine was, standing there he would he would step out and help me in a heartbeat and i'd do the same for him so oh yeah uh, the, the brotherhood is not just to your branch it's to the entire armed forces and honestly to our country so i'll help anybody that needs help and i've proven that more times than i can count and uh my wife is from northern california and she's got brothers that were both in the military uh, and she understands that and that's why we get along so well because if anybody needs my help i'm going to do whatever i can to help them unless they're you know, a tweaker. 
sorry. I can well, I can drop you off. I can drop you off at the like the, the rehab. The That's all room. I got for you, man. Yeah. That's all uh, I got for you, man. You you speaking of your wife, she was so cool, very nice to meet, and she did a lot too. She seemed like she did oh, yeah. a lot at that at the uh at the show as well. I think um a lot of people I've spoken to on the show, almost to a man, have had uh someone like your wife behind them helping them out in in one way or another other making the business or the venture um yeah successful. so I, I couldn't do it without her and i say that all the time and i'm not just saying that because she's my wife and she can probably hear me um <laughs> but you know she's we're raising a two-year-old and uh any parent out there knows that that's not an easy task and i have my son he is my doppelganger so he's a wild child <laughs> and he is a handful. Go, go, go nonstop until bedtime. And even at bedtime, you kind of got to hold him down sometimes. So uh, before that, she was in the shop with me. She was grinding on stuff. She was helping me keep the shop in much better order than it is now that my son is born because she's never out there to help me clean it up. And, but uh, she she would grind with me. She would forge with me. Uh, and she runs the books. She does all the books for our company. She helps me with like the packaging and stuff. Uh, she couldn't help today. I packaged up in the past two days. I packaged up 14 orders for Christmas because I have, I have this guarantee that if anybody orders something by November 10th, that I will have it shipped out in time for Christmas. So normally my, my, uh, my production time is about eight to 12 weeks is what I request. Like, Hey, give me two months. You know, I have back order, but, uh, if you get it in by November 10th, I will ship you your product at least like today I shipped it out. So that's 13 days until Christmas Eve. And I think the post office will deliver up until Christmas Eve is what I believe, what I read. But um, your order was in there and uh, I, I had orders go to Montana, Utah, Idaho, Illinois, uh, Tennessee, New Jersey. I mean, I ship stuff everywhere today. That's and um, I, 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 at the end of the year is always a struggle for me because I have the show. So before the show, I try and clear my board, right? Mm -hmm. I try and get all my orders fulfilled before the show so I have time to make products for the show. And then, and then I have the Christmas rush. So it's always like, go, 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 go. And she's so cool because getting back to my wife because she's able to understand that, Hey, I understand you have to work all the time. We're, we're trying to grow this business and we're doing it together. And although I can't be out there in the shop with you all the time, I'm doing my part in the house, taking care of the kid because it's, it's a struggle. <laughs> it, it is, but it's the best struggle there is. Oh, um, man, I love that boy. He's, <laughs> he's me. I, I can hear him back there. Racing oh, yeah. Hill. Um, oh yeah. So, uh, do you expect to bring him into the fold someday? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, he's not going to have a choice. Um, so I did chores my entire life in the house, right? Didn't get an allowance. And I asked my mom about it one day. That's not fair. Why don't you have to do this? And she says, this isn't a democracy. This is Cuba and I am Fidel Castro. <laughs> so something I'll always remember. So that kind of Good stuck answer. with me. Uh, yes. So he's going to have to do chores in the house. Um, but I want to teach him how to, how to work. You know, I don't want him to be one of these young people that are growing up these days that don't want to have a job. And, you know, I'm, I, I refuse to, cause I have such a work ethic that if it doesn't rub off on him, I got it from my mother. He's going to get it from me. He's going to get it from his mother. Um, but what I want to do, my, my plan is this is before he was born is he's going to work in the shop and I'm going to pay him to work in the shop. At first he'll start out sweeping and it won't be that much money. Um, but from the money that we, that we pay him, we're going to teach him how to save, you know, what taxes are. We're not going to tax him right away, but, um, <laughs> right away. We want to teach him that stuff because, you know, as a young adult, I didn't know how to manage money. When I was in the military, I blew almost all the money that I made on, let's just say, military things. Um, sorry. Um, so 
I wanted me and my wife, my wife was taught very at a young age to, to save. So I want to bring him in, pay him to work in there, teach him how to save. Okay. You got to save at first 50% for every dollar you make, you got to save 50 cents and then let him put that money into savings so that when he's a young adult, he can, um, he can have like, you know, a couple of grand to buy his own vehicle or, um, you know, something like that. That's, we just want to, he's going to have no choice in working in the shop is all I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> I hope all, he has a passion for it. Not, not only that, but, uh, okay. A couple of things. First of all, those are cooler chores than washing dishes and B it's going to, it's going to teach him a usable skill and whether he ends up in uh, going into knife making or tomahawk making or working in a shop or whatever, he's going to learn, uh, valuable skills on the abstract level. And then he might learn skills that come in handy in whatever his vocation or job is. I, th I think that's awesome when people have, uh, you know, as you know, here, I talk to a lot of knife makers and a lot of family businesses. And I love uh, the thought of bringing the child in because there's always the question at some point of who, who do I get to help me with my knives? My knives are my knives. And they're like mm -hmm. perfect how they are. And how am I yeah. going to entrust but you bring in blood and, you know, first of all, you hope some of the talent is in the blood or some of the same mm -hmm. whatever uh, thrill for making. But also they're close enough. You can you can really show them speak a, sh a shorthand and all the rest of it yeah. and uh, and bring them in in a real way. So I had an apprentice for about a year and a half. Uh, we did an apprenticeship and it was an unpaid apprenticeship and he was a. Uh, I mean, I know his mother and stuff like that. I got introduced by another acquaintance and then we became quick friends, me and his family and um, good kid named Christian. He was actually helping my buddy uh, do the forge of memory, which I think you did. Mm -hmm. uh, you did the forge, uh, not forge of memory where you made a little horseshoe knife. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I got yeah, it right over uh, on my wall. Yeah. So he, uh, he was helping him. He usually helps me at all my shows, but I trained him up and got him, got him to where I was like, all right, man, I'm comfortable enough with you making my tomahawks that I'll be able to sell them with my name on them. Cause it's, I, I had to like really drill that into him for like a year. Like, Hey man, this isn't good enough. You know what I mean? Like you're not meeting the standards that I'm trying to set for you. And I can be kind of a dick, excuse my French, but I was trying to be cool with them. And you know, and, but after telling you the third time, like you're doing this wrong, this is the third time I've told you, no, this isn't going to work. Um, well, finally, he got through his apprenticeship and tested to where he made 10 tomahawks. And we inspected every single one of them. And me and my wife scrutinized them to the T. All right, man, I feel comfortable enough to where I can start paying you. He came like, I don't know, 10 days after I was like, yeah, I'll start paying you. And then he could just quit coming. I was like, so I wasted a year of my life wow. training this kid. And now he doesn't come anymore. He only comes to the shows to do the tomahawk throwing and stuff like that, which is a big help. Still love him. Good kid. Great family. Uh, but I'm like, damn, I, I spent so much. So now I'm like real hesitant about pulling on an apprentice. Like, I don't want to invest that kind of time in somebody and effort because it's, it's stressful for me yeah. to have to teach somebody something like this and make sure that they get across that my standards will not dip with you working for me. Like, yeah, I've built a reputation. And we, you're going to uphold my reputation because you're, you're working under my logo, my name, my business. So to, I understand what you're saying about yeah. placements, not wanting other people to make stuff for them. Yeah. So. And, and, and your son can't just stop coming. <laughs> you know, it's no. like, you live here, dude. He's, yeah. <laughs> and he seems like he has a passion for it. Like uh, he's only two. So he likes to be out there in the shop when I'm out there and, I gave him a hammer and he hammered on the anvil. I haven't given him any hot steel yet. My wife's like, no, but we've done it already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Girls night, but, uh, you know, you can bring out the, yeah. <laughs> when she's like, out with the let's ladies. Just make, let's just hammer on something, buddy. And he would love it. Uh, anytime I'm out there, he wants to be out there. But obviously we can't have him in the shop because he's too little and yeah. he's too into everything. He'll grab something hot or he'll get slag in his face or, you know, so yeah. Yeah. When he's in like the a shop, fine line have, right now, you have to spend a hundred percent of your attention. Uh -huh. on him. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and I bet that's a blast for him. I mean, to see dad, yeah. to be with dad and, but in a space like that, like that's a real, uh, I'm not saying it, it, 
like I know a lot of artistic women and stuff, but that's kind of a man's space with all the fire oh, yeah. and the hammers and stuff. Um, so I could see how a, a boy would just be like, yes, let's go to the forum. Yeah. Uh, I so, mean, and what little boy doesn't like knives? <laughs> like they all do, most, you know, exactly. Um, e even the ones who don't think they do, do. Yeah. Um, but okay. So in wrapping up here, something, something like a common theme here and, and it's common in the show, uh, cause I saw it firsthand and experienced it, but is it's the interaction thing. Uh, one of my favorite annual, uh, latest, you know, past three or four years. Uh, I love going to blade show tech, uh, uh, blade show Atlanta. It's like, it's amazing. There's 50 billion knife makers and 50 million things to see and you can be there for three days and never exhaust them and that's great i love that show but coming to the texas custom knife show was different for me it was it was an interactive experience there were uh, knife makers that i had never met before or or seen before and it it sort of opened up my eyes to the fact that you could probably go texas is a unique place no doubt but you could probably go to any locality in the united states and find a knife show in that region and you'll, oh, yeah. you'll meet people and see knives you've never oh my god it's such a huge world um mm -hmm. but a, a real thing that i think uh separated uh, the experience of the texas custom knife show for me was the interaction not just with the forged and fire uh, personalities in the forged and fire competition which was awesome but all these other things the tomahawk throwing the 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 the, the knife i forged myself uh you know forged myself yeah. uh with the horseshoe and all of that like it wasn't just looking and buying it was experiencing and becoming a part of the experience how do you want to grow the texas custom knife show what like what's how do you see that kernel um expanding so the entertainment like i have complaints from the guys that come there just to sell knives i, I understand where they're coming from you came here you bought a table you want to sell a knife not complaints just like hey you know Anyways, we'll get, move on. It's an entertainment value for me. Uh, when I go somewhere, I don't, I'm not a shopper, first of all. My wife will tell you firsthand, I will not walk around a store just to shop. I go to a store for a certain particular reason, I get it and I roll out. So to me to come to one of these events, I want something to entertain me, you know, the, the forging competition, having the opportunity to throw tomahawks and possibly win one, having the opportunity to forge out a horseshoe knife stuff like that brings in crowds and that's my mindset at least um and anything that you can do to entertain your your fan base or your customer base and keep them there longer is just going to make the show better so in asking how do we expand that kernel um i've got some ideas uh, i don't want to divulge at the moment just because they're just they're just ideas and I've got to talk them over with my partner. <laughs> so, um, but we, we will be growing it and we will be doing bigger and better things and bigger, better events, more knife makers, and hopefully more people come into the show. So that's what we look forward to. Well, I, I, I like hearing that you've got the ideas and that you're going to talk to Mike about them. Cause that just means, uh, that hopefully I'll be coming out again, uh, next oh, year. Bob, you are always invited. Uh, I love and it. you always got a spot here, man. We we loved having you in. My wife, she, you know, I told her that we were doing another interview. She's like, that guy was so nice. I love that guy. And I was oh, like, cool. yeah, you know, so it, you made a very good impression. And uh, with everybody that I've talked to about you, uh, Brian, your doppelganger is uh, is probably jealous just because you're more handsome than he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll take it. I don't know if you I don't know if you told your listeners, but uh Brian Malinsky entered a knife into one of our competitions and won into our award competition that we do on Friday just for the knife makers. And he walked up and I was like, Bob, I didn't know you made knives, man. I thought you were just a collector. And he's like, it's me, Brian, who I've met like 50 times. So it was quite funny. It was hilarious. And then every time I saw one of them, I was like, that's Bob, that's Brian, that's Bob, that's Brian. So the, the whole weekend we had a good time talking about how you guys are so yeah look so much alike so i think i've got a picture on my phone or somebody has a picture of you guys standing next to each other so i'm glad you did a, a show with them i'm gonna have to check that one out 
if, if either one of us were more nefarious, we could figure out a way to like really work this profit on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's just not me. Hey, Jake, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It was really cool to uh, uh, talk about the experience. We talked about it leading up, and I also had Mike on the show leading up. I was uh, so excited to be invited out there, but having been out there and experienced it, um, it was really cool to just kind of catch up with you and and find out what it was like actually putting the event on. Uh, one last thing before I let you dip here, and that is if there are people out there listening who who are interested in starting a knife show or doing something like this and getting a group of knife uh, like minded people together, what bit of advice would you give them? Um, I, I would say don't do it, but that's <laughs> just me. Um, no, you got to have a plan and you've got to know people. Obviously you got to have, a, uh, be able to network. You got to be able to get the knife makers to come out, um, having a plan and executing it is crucial. Um, and get all the help you can get is all I can say. I mean, anybody that offers help, let them help you. Uh, cause it is a lot to put on and, you know, weeks coming into the show, my wife is always like, I hate this part of the show. You're always stressed out. You don't sleep. You're, you're like super irritable. And then once the show's over, she's like, ah, oh, see, now you're back to normal. So, um, just know that it's not, it's not easy, but if you have the right help and the right plan, you can get it done. So right and be a success. It doesn't hurt to have a great theme too. You guys have such a good theme, but, uh, yeah, appreciate uh what, it. I, I would also venture to say that Texas is part of the theme. It's so cool being down there and it's such a part of, it was such a part of my experience, like actually being right where yeah. we were. So come barbecue on, and knives, the barbecue <laughs> and knives. Indeed. Well, sir, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's been great talking with you, Jake. Talk with you soon. You guys have a good night. I appreciate it. Thank you. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jake Sewell of Bravehawk Forge and the Texas Custom Knife Show. Uh, it, like I said, it was a real honor to, honor to be on the inside of that for uh, the brief period of time I was. And it was uh, impressive to see uh, Jake and Mike uh, put that thing together. Uh, what a blast it was. And I look forward to going down there next year. Uh, all right. Be sure to join us on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. We're going to be doing a knife giveaway very soon of a pro tech Malibu. Yes. Sweet. And uh, also Thursday night knives for the latest in knife conversation for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Quack, quack.